All right, so we have some slides from an old presentation I gave on uh, failure due to cervical buckling. Uh, it's basically uh, what happens in a neck injury. So a lot of what I'll talk about, just real quickly actually, the importance of cervical buckling analysis and uh, exactly what cervical buckling is. A lot of the biomechanical analysis uh, I'll go, I'll skip over. Um, a lot of that I've, I've forgotten over the years anyways. And then just how to stabilize the cervical spine after after failure. And then conclusions and questions obviously skip over that. All right, so some of the importance of uh, on the analysis, the fact that the neck, uh, the spine has some biomechanical properties that are extremely highly complex and uh, just the degree of freedom that it can move around and then, then you have the density of, of the bone and um, you know, of the vertebrae, each vertebrae is different as well as the connective tissue and, and this is different from person to person so it's extremely hard to uh, to be able to build models even computational models as well as trying to I mean when you use some of the physical models you're just using cadavers and that's obviously uh, a limited resource and what you're trying to study are uh, these properties to help with injury prevention uh, motor vehicle accidents or just collisions in high impact sports and uh, um, a reason why you want to, you want to, I guess, improve the injury prevention is because it can lead to spinal cord injuries. And for me, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but I think it's arguably one of the most severe sustainable injuries. And um, physically, because the injury happens to uh, usually to a younger demographic, you're talking about over 10, 20, 30 years. The, the paralyzed body begins to, to uh, degrade in a lot of different ways and that has to be monitored and, and you really keep a close eye on. A lot of things happen. Economically, obviously, the, over the duration of time, medical expenses can really build, uh, build up uh, as well as uh, adaptive technology can, can build up. And then socially, again, when you're talking about um, trying to even integrate back into mainstream society, that's probably one of the hardest uh, hurdles to overcome. And those all uh, really intertwine with each other. Okay, this is what cervical buckling is. And you have seven vertebrae in the neck. And kind of what happens is uh, you get this bending motion. It's a combination of flexion and extension. And you either are flexing your neck or extending your neck. But obviously when you get this combination, you get this, this wave going on, usually a second degree or first degree. And uh, that's when the injury starts to occur, usually around the four or five. Yeah, and then these are all, this is timed out, but these are all the slides that we're skipping. Um, okay, this one, though, I thought was very interesting. It had to do with a, a rigid impact surface and a soft impact surface. And when the head, the graph on the left side, the head hits a rigid impact surface and actually deflects off to the side is what happens. Now, there's obviously that large spike in the imp in the the impact of uh, the force and injury does occur in the neck at about two kilonewtons and uh, is done very quickly as well but now the graph on the right side what we see is that injury occurs at about one kilonewton and and it takes longer for this to happen but what happens is the injury um, in the test the injury was actually a much more severe both in the fracture as well as the the tendons that um, are the ligaments that connected uh, or that were in the injury site. And this has to do with the fact of uh, what they call head pocketing, basically. Once the head hits the impact, the padded impact surface, it has a tendency to stick and stay, and it doesn't move. And so the torso continues to move in whatever direction it's moving. That puts the neck in a pretty vulnerable position. Um, and that's how the injury, a lot of the wicked injuries occur. Here we have, you know, just a cross-section of, uh, of an injury where the you see the burst fracture on the left side and that's what it does it punctures the spinal cord and then on the right side it's it's fixed through bone grafts and and um, fusion here okay this is what they do they put you in uh, traction to begin with to help stabilize the neck before they go in and go ahead and fuse uh, the vertebrae when they go in this is the anterior fusion when they go in from the front they usually take a bone graft from your pelvis and help uh, and put plates and um, here this is when they go in from the back they'll actually shave down the spinous process those 
pointy things in the back of your neck and help you use that too. Um, this doesn't show plates being put in, but usually they do uh, do that. Okay, these are actually my x-rays of my injury. And just, you can take note, both the C4, 5, and 6 are all fused together. You have a plate in the front and in the back. But if you look at C3, you'll actually see that it's slipping off. And this gets addressed a year later. Um, here, this is just a, a view from the front. The butterfly looking bracket, um, that's the one that was in the front. Then the skinnier one is the one that's in the back. And uh, it just depends on the, the nature of the injury, where how the surgeon really wants to go back. Okay, now this was after a year when they went in and fixed the uh, straightened things out because the ligaments between three and four never really healed and so they were able to pull out one of the brackets and use the existing bracket to straighten things out and that's this all this stuff that we were going to skip there you go hope you learned something